I didn't outrun my theme music. Sorry, everyone. So how are we all doing? We having a good day? All right. I'll, I'll take that as good. So a um, few things before we get started. Uh, first off, two of the things we strive for here is access to content and that everybody has a great experience. Now, we understand that some of the sessions had a bit more demand than we had anticipated, so we're gonna do two things. First off, we're opening up more space, and second, we're gonna look at rerunning some of those sessions as well. All right. I love it when you all agree with me, that's very nice. And so we'll be sending information out on, out on that later today. Uh, there is an app that you can download, actually. I don't know if I told you this. <laughs> all right, good, that was a test you all passed, good. Okay, so now that we've got that out of the way, I'm actually extremely excited and, and in all honesty honored to be able to bring the next uh, two guys up here. Um, you've probably heard a lot today about people who've been transforming their business with inbound marketing. Uh, and a lot of that couldn't happen without the two people who are coming up. So please, everybody, welcome the co-founders of HubSpot, Brian Halligan and Dharmesh Shah. So it's gonna be a very exciting, exciting day for all of you, very exciting day. It turns out it's gonna be a very exciting day for the two of us too, because for the first time, we're gonna get a real good look at the back of our heads. <laughs> Pretty gray, grayer than I thought, Darmesh. Yeah. Okay, cool. Darmesh is gonna talk about the new vision, I'm gonna talk about the new technology, take it away. Thanks, Brian. All right. So I was up at 2.30 in the morning yesterday, or this morning, I guess, asking myself why you're all here. Why are they all here? Not like in an existential sense, like why am I on the planet, what am I doing here kind of thing, but like why are you at the conference? And my guess was you're here to, to learn, you're here to connect, make new friends, and you're here to be inspired. And I have this, um, this thing I'm gonna try out. I'm gonna ask questions, you should do this for every speaker, Right? If, the, if the speaker asks a question and your response is yes, like don't raise your hand because we can't really see out there, just applaud if you agree, and that's your kind of affirmative signal response. Okay, so we're gonna try this out. How many people were inspired by Seth Godin's talk this morning? Like just inspired, <laughs> inspired. Okay. So that works. So normally, I, I geek out about technology and product features Today I want to talk to you about humans. Now some of you that know me are scratching their heads a little bit. It's like, since when does Dharmesh like humans? <laughs> because on the extrovert to introvert scale, I am decidedly, decidedly on the introvert side. Now it's, I think it's a mistake to think of introverts as not liking humans. Uh, I like humans a lot. Um, as it turns out, some of my favorite living things are, are humans. Um, that's my wife, Kirsten, who's in the audience. Hi, sweetie. Um, that's my son, Sohan. And, and Sohan's not here, and I just checked on my iPhone through the wonders of modern technology, and he's not here because, like, in his world, he doesn't know that there's more than 500 people on the planet. Seeing 5,000 people in one place might just, like, blow his little baby mind, so he's not here. <laughs> so let's talk about humans. So once upon a time, way back when, we had these things called phones. And when we dialed a number on these phones, there was this little spinny thing on the phone. Now, a lot of you that are younger had never seen these little spinny things, they were called dials. And we say dial number, that's what we meant back then. It's because buttons hadn't been invented yet, by the way, that's, that's why. And, um, and there was this diabolical feature in these old phones. There was a tiny little bell inside the phone and when someone called the phone, the bell rang. Now what made it diabolical 
was that humans of the day were psychologically programmed that when the little bell went off, they answered the phone. You had no idea who was calling. Bell rings, human answers phone. You could be on your way to bed, in bed, on your way out of bed. Bell rings, human answers phone. That was then. Now we have very sophisticated phones. They tell us who's calling. They can take messages on our behalf. They have computers powerful enough to run small countries. Very, very advanced. Technology has advanced. Back then, we had TV. Now, we had a very limited number of channels back then. I personally, I think I remember like seven channels. And for those of you that were wise enough to procreate and train tiny little humans to like hold the bunny ears just right, you could maybe get like nine and a half channels, right? If, just, if, you, if they just held it just right, you got nine and a half instead of seven. That was then. Now, we command hundreds and hundreds of channels, nine and a half of which have pretty good content. Um, it's, it's awesome. <laughs> Back then, we had these things called VCRs, video cassette recorders. And for the entire time that people owned these video cassette recorders, they blinked 12. The entire time that people owned them, they blinked 12. Now, now there were rumors, rumors, that somewhere, somehow, people had figured out how to record Dynasty when it was going to play on Thursday, and it was only Tuesday. Those rumors were never substantiated, never substantiated. But humanity has moved forward. Well, now we have DVRs, digital video recorders. Some of, them, some of you know them as TiVos, just in case you're wondering. TiVo, same thing, DVRs. They allow mere mortals to program things in the future without having to actually program the clock. You just like pick a show and it records. It's awesome. Humanity has moved forward. Back then, when you had a question, when you were looking for something, you meandered through the dark, scary place called the internet looking for that thing, looking for the, the important answers to questions like, like, does the African swallow, and given its airspeed sp velocity, can it really carry a coconut? Those kinds of questions that occur to people. <laughs> that was then. That was then. Now we have Google, all-knowing Google, answer to every possible question you could possibly ask. Back then, we were disconnected, and we felt isolated and alone in this big, big, dark world. But now we have Facebook. <laughs> and so we're connected and feel isolated and alone <laughs> in this big, big, dark world. We used to be tied to our desks. If you wanted to use the internet, you had to use this ginormous computer that we called a desktop. That's what we had to use. Now we carry the internet around in our pockets. Lots and lots of change. So a fundamental observation, all of this leads up to things have happened in the last 100 years. Humanity has moved forward. Our lives have changed. The way we work and live has changed. The way we learn, the way we share has changed. And the way we shop and the way we buy has changed. Now we are informed, we have the internet. We are in touch, we have social media. And we are in charge because we have a near infinite number of choices for anything we could possibly want. But despite all this change, this massive tear in the fabric of the universe, despite all this change, too many companies are still frozen in time. Still, still using methods from 50, 100 years ago, the same methods. Now that might be okay. That might be okay if the same old thinking was giving us the same old results. If the same old thinking was giving us the same old results, that might be okay. That's not what's happening. If the same old thinking was giving us no results, the return on investment is zero. You spend $10,000 on a marketing campaign and nothing happens. Even then, even then, it actually might be excusable, it might be okay. The problem is, those same old methods often generate negative ROI, less than zero. Not zero, less than zero. And some of you may be wondering, well, like, how is that possible? How can I spend $10,000 on a direct mail campaign 
and actually create negative return. And the way you create negative return is, yes, you got some minor, minor, minor response, but in exchange for that campaign, you irritated people, you annoyed them, and they have fundamentally decided never, ever to buy from you. So what you're doing with those outdated methods that interrupt and annoy people, here's what's happening. You are annoying them, they've decided not to buy from you, you are damaging your brand, damaging your business, and digging yourself into a hole that someone's going to have to dig you out of later. It's negative. But we know now there's a better way. We know that the better way is to create value before we try to extract it. Focus on the human, focus on the people. And we call this inbound marketing. And it's awesome. But I'm not here to tell you how awesome inbound marketing is. I've been doing that for seven years. I have committed seven years of my life to getting up on stages as an introvert, as an introvert, telling people how awesome inbound marketing is. I've appealed to your left brain, the analytical side, and said, hey, inbound marketing is much more efficient. The ROI is higher, cost per lead is lower. I've appealed to the analytical part of your brain. I've appealed to the creative side, the right side of your brain, the emotional side. I've used pictures of puppies. <laughs> I've used pictures of kittens. <laughs> and of course, of course, I've met Seth, Seth Godin, and so I have used pictures of babies. And babies work awesome, as we've heard from Seth. Now, so committed am I to my craft and to our collective cause to spread inbound, so committed am I, I had my own child. I had my own child, so my images would be that much more evocative, <laughs> and my message that much more persuasive, and so we could kind of move, move things forward. But no, I'm not here to just talk about inbound marketing. I'm here to share the biggest insight we've had in the last seven years and share with you the biggest idea, the biggest revelation since inbound marketing. And I'm going to tell you what those are. Who wants to hear what those are? Just another, okay. The big insight is that inbound marketing is not the answer. Inbound, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause for dramatic effect and say it again. Inbound marketing is not the answer. Now some of you are sitting up in your chairs, it's like whoa, 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 whoa. Did at Darmesh, because I know you guys are geeky, you say at Darmesh in your heads, I know, it's okay. <laughs> did at Darmesh just say, after seven years, did he just say that inbound marketing is not the answer? Does he know, does he know that he happens to be on the big stage at the inbound conference? Yes and yes. Yes, I did say inbound marketing is not the answer. And yes, I do know I happen to be on the keynote stage at the inbound conference. Now, in order for you to understand, in order for you to decode what I'm about to tell you, we need to go through this exercise. Um, and it's going to feel a little bit awkward for some of you. Um, here's what I, I need you all to do, collectively. We're all gonna pretend that we're human, okay? We're all gonna pretend that we're human. I know it's hard to be human when you're thinking about work, right? It's like, well, I'm a marketer, I'm a salesperson, I'm an entrepreneur, this is what I, but we can all do this together, right? For those of you that have more practice, like pretending that you're human, help your buddies out, we're gonna all, everybody ready? Everybody like thinking human, human thoughts, human, 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 okay. We're all human. Now imagine as a human, you're looking to buy something looking to buy something. So you search on the internet, like lots of normal humans do, and you find this brilliant ebook that just illuminates the topic for you. It is just so useful, and you're like, awesome. This is great inbound marketing. As a human, it makes you happy. Now imagine that same scenario, and you reach out to the company, because brilliant ebook, brilliant inbound marketing, and you reach out to the company, and the experience you have with the sales team is just terrible. Now, as a human, do you find yourselves thinking, you know what? 
Their inbound marketing was so awesome. It was so awesome. The fact that the sales experience was awful doesn't really matter. As a human, people don't think that way. They don't separate marketing and sales and service and everything else. Humans, normal humans, experience the whole thing. It's all connected. And so the big revelation is that inbound marketing is not the complete answer. If we're looking to grow our businesses, it can't just be about delivering an awesome marketing experience. It cannot just be about that. So the big idea, the one we're gonna dig into here, is what we call the inbound experience. And the inbound experience is the end-to-end, -end, human-focused experience. It's about every touch point with the customer and making that entire thing, the thing that humans actually care about, make that entire thing, the entire experience, awesome. That's what the inbound experience is. So, we're gonna dig in. The inbound experience is about pe putting people at the center of focus. Now, this is not a hard concept for those of you familiar with inbound marketing. The inbound in inbound marketing means to be human, to be empathetic, to put people at the center. So an inbound experience is exactly that. We're just kind of broadening the scope. We need to reimagine the complete customer experience, all of it. And so inbound experience is about inbound marketing, it's about inbound sales, and it's about inbound service. We're gonna talk about those things. So let's talk about inbound marketing. As you know, it's about humanizing marketing. Instead of interrupting, you work on attracting. And now the great news is, you guys are doing a great job. The people in this room are doing an awesome job and it thrills me, thrills me, that the number of certified inbound marketers is growing and the number of certifiable interruption marketers is diminishing. That just thrills me, thrills me. So let's talk about, there's still a couple of issues that I wanna talk about when it comes to inbound marketing and then we're gonna to go to sales and service. There are 5.1 billion searches happening in Google every single day. 5.1 billion, there's seven billion people on the planet. So that's like 72% of the people on the planet like doing a Google search every day is the equivalent of that. Not that every single person's doing it, but you, you get it. So despite this, we know this, right? And some of them are actually searching for like products and services to buy. So despite this, there are millions and millions and millions of businesses that are still practically invisible online. Practically invisible when it comes to Google. Now we take it for granted, all of you, are likely getting this right, but I assure you, there are still millions of businesses out there that just cannot be found. And there are billions of searches, millions of invisible businesses, that's a problem, that's an opportunity. So if you are selling marketing services, if you are helping people do inbound marketing, this is a massive opportunity. There is still so much, so much to be done. Shifting mindsets, this is, um, this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Applaud if you've seen this. This is, yeah. It's, so, for those of you unfamiliar, which is about 17% of you that didn't applause, or maybe you just don't applaud for anything, which is okay, that's completely cool. Um, you know, you have the physiological needs like food, sleep, that kind of thing, and it goes all the way up to things like self-actualization. And I'm gonna posit to you that humanity has changed. Humanity has changed. Technology and society has moved forward, and that there is a new layer in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's called the phone. <laughs> and there have been countless studies, I am not making this up, countless studies about how in, the phone for lots of people is like a new organ that we grew as a result of our evolutionary process, a new organ. It is attached to us. We go to bed with it, we wake up in the morning with it, and we look at it 150 times on average a day. It is a part of us. Right? It's like the deep, like you can take things away. It's like, oh, well, you know what? You know, they've done surveys. Would you rather give up sex for seven days for a week or would you give up your phone? It's the phone, sorry. It's a multi-gender audience too, by the way, just for the record. All right, so we have these phones. We're attached to them. We use them a lot. The overall traffic coming from mobile devices 
has grown from roughly 1% of all traffic used to come from the internet about five years ago. That's grown to 15%. Now, I'm no Nate Silver, who is awesome, but I do not see this particular graph like all of a sudden like starting to slope downward. That all of a sudden people are like, oh, that whole internet on your mobile device thing, that was just a fad. We're not gonna do that anymore. That's unlikely, unlikely to happen. So here's the thing that bothers me. We know this, right? We know how attached to our, uh, we are and our customers are to our phones. We know how integral it is. We know they're using it. And yet, instead of websites being mobile friendly, they're often mobile hostile, mobile hostile. So applaud if you've ever had the experience where you visit a mobile website by clicking on a link in their email and you go to the website and you're like, they're just messing with me. They're just messing with me because they sent me. Their email sent me to their website. They know. It's like, it's mobile hostile. This is, not, this is just not right. It's just not right. Um, so let's talk about, and this is the part that I get geeked out a little bit. Um, I'm going to geek out on the topic of brand because there's this massive shift that happens that has happened that no one has really talked about yet. And it's, it's geeky, so I warn you now. Uh, so brand, I'm a, there are fancy definitions for the word brand. I'm not a fancy guy, so I like this one, which is basically it's what people think of you. It's what people think of you. And so its brand has always been tied around this notion of human perception, right? Apple's brand in your mind is what your perception of Apple is and their products and their service and what they stand for. So what I'm gonna posit to you now is that brand has changed a lot. So now not only is it about human perceptions, what people think and what they carry around in their heads, it's about machine predictions. It's about software and algorithms that run on servers all over the place and I'm going to explain. Let's look at Google and Google search. Humans at Google, I think all they do is employ humans right now, um, but humans at Google wrote the algorithm for the search and that algorithm has exactly one purpose. And that purpose is to predict how likely is this web page to make humans happy. If Google thinks through its algorithm that this web page is likely to make humans happy, that page ranks. If the algorithm predicts that page will not make humans happy, that page does not rank. So your brand is living inside of the Google algorithm on the Google servers. When you send email out, the email servers, Gmail, AOL, Yahoo, all of them, they watch how people react to your emails. They watch and they're like, oh, this particular company happens to send really crappy emails, really crappy, low quality, spammy emails. What happens? those emails don't get delivered. It just stops because your brand sits inside those email servers, inside those algorithms, trying to figure out whether you are trustworthy or not and should that email go through or not. So this brings me to my controversial prediction is that people get crappy calls all the time, all the time. Now imagine this experience. Imagine you get a call and you mistakenly answer it despite not knowing who it is because you have, some of you have this genetic flaw that causes you to answer all phone calls. That's okay, some of you have that. Um, but imagine that you went through that call and it was crappy. Imagine a, a button pops up on your phone that says, downvote, that was a crappy call. Now imagine that data getting logged and imagine millions of people doing exactly that thing every single day. Here's what happens. And this, is, this will happen, makes too much sense. Same thing happened in search, same thing happened in email, it's going to happen with phones, is that smartphones are going to get smarter and smarter and they're going to kill stupid calls. Because what will happen, thank you, it's going to kill stupid calls. Um, because now the machines know, the machines know, it's like, wait a second, this call is coming in, this is kind of like the Yelp for phone numbers and phone calls, it's like, this is a crappy company, your phone won't even ring, just like you don't get the email in your inbox or whatever, it's like it won't even ring, you will never know it happened, it'll stop before it even gets to you, that's where we're headed. So the idea behind this and all of inbound marketing is to solve for the humans. Solve for the humans, that's what it's all about. Think about the person, think about whether this is going to make them happy or irritate them, and that's what it's all about. So that's inbound marketing. Let's talk about sales. And we're going to talk about humanizing sales. And it took a fair amount of discipline not to use any cheesy used car salesperson photos and draw on stereotypes that we've known for years and years. So I'm not going to do those. I'm going to instead dig into data. There was a study published in the Harvard Business Review recently, this year, talking about and looking at how people make buying decisions. 
What are the things they look at when they decide to buy from company A versus buying from company B? And part of the results were unsurprising. It's like, oh, people care about what you sell. What does the product do? How much does it cost? What's the availability? They care about the product. That wasn't surprising. What was surprising is they also care as much, a little bit more, about how you sell. Now this was a revelation. It's not just what you sell, not just what you sell, it's how you sell it. Now some of you are gonna pause me and say, well, that must have been a consumer example. If I'm buying a dishwasher and it's the same dishwasher from A or versus B, I'm going to go to the place that has the convenient experience. That makes sense, but this wouldn't apply in B2B. When people are making sophisticated purchases, surely, surely, they care about the product much, much more and what it does. And the answer is this entire study, the entire study was completely around B2B buyers. There were no consumers involved. People care about how you sell. The other thing that's changed in sales is before we had what's known as information asymmetry. Dan Pink talks about that in his, in his book. Information asymmetry basically means that back then, the seller had lots of information about the product, about the company, and the buyer had very, very little. A seller has a bunch of information, buyer has very little, as a result of which the seller has the leverage because she knows everything about the product and the company, and the buyer doesn't. She holds that information, she has that leverage, as a result of which she, the salesperson, controls the process. That is no longer true. We live in the age of the internet, and now we have information symmetry. When you go out to buy a car now, chances are you're going to do some research, and you're going to look up that car, look up the reviews, figure out how much that dealer paid, what their margins are, you're going to know more about that car than probably most of the salespeople that are on the, on the showroom floor, right? That's just how it works. And that's happening across the board now, not just in consumer. So the behavior that's changed is before, when you had something sophisticated to buy, the very first thing you did, very early in the process, you contacted sales. Why did you do this? It is not because you were crazy. It's because the salesperson had the information. In order for you to make any progress, the very first thing you did was like, oh, I need information about price, or I need this, or anything. you had to talk to a salesperson. Now we have the internet and we have information symmetry. So now people contact sales much later. I looked at several studies. This was the lowest number I could find. So basically what it's telling us is that at least 57% of the buying process has already occurred by the time someone contacts sales. Has already occurred before they pick up the phone and talk to a salesperson. So what does this mean for you and your businesses? Your website needs to be doing a lot of work. If you have a bunch of information under lock and key that you only kind of spoon feed to people after they call your sales, you're toast. That is not the way humans expect to be able to buy things now. So the advice here is don't obsess over your selling process. It's like, oh, well, on the third call, we're going to reveal this information. On the fifth call, we will provide these white papers if asked, and then this. It doesn't work that way. It does not work that way. What you need to do is obsess over delivering an exceptional buying experience, an exceptional buying experience. That's how you win. Another big shift in the world of sales. Back then, we had this notion of buyer beware, caveat emptor, and this was Logical, right? Because if you were a buyer and you bought something, or were sold something, more likely, and you were completely displeased with the product or the company, you had very little recourse. Very little recourse. Maybe you would complain to five of your friends the next day. It's like, oh, that company, they're sleazy. Don't buy from them. Maybe you would write like a sternly written letter and put it in their suggestion box or something or mail it to the CEO. Um, and, and we've long since known that the pen is mightier than the sword, and I think that's still true. Like the written word is, st is still mightier. I'm gonna posit to you that the tweet <laughs> is mightier still. Now when you tweet, 50 of your friends see it, some of them retweet it, some internet celebrity sees it, and word can spread very, very quickly. So what does this mean for sellers? It means we no longer live in an age where you can just focus on the transaction. There's no drive-by sales anymore. 
buyers have a recourse. Buyers have both choice and they have voice. So now we live in an age where it's actually seller beware because the internet has an infinite memory. So if you start screwing people, the world is going to know. You need to be beware of what your actions are. So let's talk about service and humanizing service. And the first argument I'm going to give you is that the goal of both service and the overall company is not customer satisfaction. It is not customer satisfaction. The goal is customer delightion. And yes, I know that's not a real word. <laughs> but it should be, and that's how words get created. People start using them, and then uh, and it happens. So we're gonna, call, we're gonna talk about delightion and why that's important and how you do it. And to illustrate this by way of example, I want to uh, introduce you to Jim. Jim is the CIO of Acme Anvils. And much like a lot of CIOs, he is very skeptical because he's being sold to all day long. And unlike most CIOs, Jim actually has a second career as a stock photography model in case the whole CIO thing doesn't, doesn't work out. <laughs> but our purpose now, so let's say Jim buys from you. Your purpose now is to delight Jim, not satisfy Jim, delight Jim. And he needs to have this delightion moment. He needs to be at the office and something good is like, I am brilliant. That is a thought that needs to be going through. Is that I am brilliant, and the subtext is for having chosen you and bought your product, but I am brilliant. I rock. That's what you want Jim thinking. When he goes home, you want him rocking out on his air guitar. He's just so happy. That's what delightion looks like. Now, once you do this, an interesting thing starts to happen. Now, historically, we've always known that it's important to make customers happy. We haven't quite looked at it in this way. And the reason is we always talk about, especially in B2B, we always talk about customer lifetime value. So let's say you've sold to Acme Anvils. Someone somewhere is doing a projection that says, well, on average, our customers stay for five years and they tend to buy this much. And so Acme Anvils, the customer, has this much lifetime value to us. This is how much money we stand to make from this company. That's a good measure, but it's not the best measure of the economics of how delation works. The best measure is actual person lifetime value. And the person lifetime value is, oh, Jim is delighted. Who's he going to tell? He's going to tell his friends, his colleagues, his spouse, his dog. He's going to tell everybody if you get him to that level. And then all of a sudden, let's say he leaves Acme Anvils. Is he going to stop talking about you if you've delighted him that much? No. He's going to take you with him to every company he goes. That's the power of delation. So imagine all that value. So what you've done, essentially, is turn Jim into an advocate. And the more advocates you have, the fewer ads you need to buy. Because now Jim and people like Jim are out there marketing on your behalf, selling on your behalf, promoting your company, advocating your product. And that's what really matters. So we haven't talked a lot about like measurement we're gonna talk about a little bit of measurement and the thing that bothers me about it. So we're talking about customer delation. And one of the questions is like, well, like how do we do that? How do we delight customers? How do we break through from just happy to delighted? And the answer is um, don't get focused too much on measurement. Measuring what matters is really, really important. Doing what matters is even more important. Think about the human. How many people have bought from Zappos in their lifetime? No, applaud. No raising of hands, I can't see you. Okay, a lot of you. And so if you've bought from Zappos, chances are you've had a moment of delightion with Zappos, right? For instance, you may have ordered shoes at 10 p.m., paid normal shipping, and then at like 11 a.m. the next day the, sh the shoes show up, right? That's the common example. Yeah, exactly, it's awesome, right? That's a moment of delation. That's the, and it's focused on the human, right? It's focused on, it's like, oh, wouldn't it be nice for them to get their shoes? And uh, I mean, that's a great example. Now, some of you are going to argue, well, Darmesh, that's great, but, but Zappos is a huge company. They can afford to do what matters. They can afford 
to focus on the human. And my argument to you is not Zappos is a big company so they can afford to focus on the human. My argument is they focused on the human, which is why they're a big, successful company. That's why. That's the kind of thing we need to be doing. Just think about it. So solve for the humans. For the B2B companies that are out there, take examples from the best consumer companies, from the Apples of the world and the, and the Zappos of the world, and learn from them. Just don't get left uh, B2B behind. That's like the best lessons, <laughs> the best, best lessons are in consumer companies because they have to think about this happiness stuff. Uh, a lot of them don't, but uh, a lot of them do, the best ones do. So I'm gonna close out this section by saying the most valuable customers are not those who buy the most. Those are not the most valuable customers. The most valuable customers are those who sell the most. They're the ones who advocate for you the most. So you could have a customer that doesn't really buy that much from you, but is telling the entire world that customer has much more value. So, we've established humans have changed dramatically. We live different lives, technology has moved us forward. And I like this Deming quote because I like Deming, but I find it a little dark and a little passive aggressive. Right, it's a little passive aggressive. Uh, I mean, the, the notion is right though, right? Like you have to change. Uh, I, I like to think about it a little bit more positive terms which is change creates a challenge for the incumbents. And the reason it creates a, cha a challenge is because big companies have a hard time changing. New entrants, smaller companies, more nimble companies, faster growing companies change more readily, right? And I love that because I am an advocate, as is all of HubSpot, about small businesses. So I'm gonna share an interesting piece of data with you. This is a study of the Fortune 1000, not just the Fortune 1000, but the top companies, the top 20 in the Fortune 1000, the best of the best across decades. And what the data looks at is how many of those companies that are the best of the best, how new are they? So in 73 to 83, 35% of the companies that were in the list were new. Went to 45% a decade later, 60% a decade after that, and then this year, it's expected that 70%, 70% of the top companies in the Fortune 1000 are new. That is exceptionally exciting news, right? That is exceptionally exciting news. And the reason it's exciting, and the reason this happens, is because big companies are much more likely to react to revolt than deliberately design for delight. Big companies react to revolt. It's like, oh, my customers are revolting. The pitchforks are out. Maybe I need to do something about the customer satisfaction thing. That's, that's what they do. And so, exceptionally exciting time for us. Now, a lot of you are marketers in the room. Applaud if you're a marketer. Just that's what you do, most of you. And you've heard me talk a lot about the inbound experience and this expansion thing, and you're wondering, like, what does this mean? It's like, are we done now? It's like, can we just say, oh, we're done? And the answer is no. In marketing, our work is not done, and you work, if you work in anything other than marketing, sales, service, everything else, our work has just begun. Sales is now where marketing was seven years ago. There is lots to be done to make it more inboundy. So I'm gonna close with a story. So it's 2013, and the story takes place seven years from now. It's 2020. My son, Sohan, is about 10 years old. And he's going to ask me to buy something by showing it on his iPad 19, or whatever version is out at that time. <laughs> and he's gonna say, Daddy, can I, can I have this? And I'm going to say, no, and let me explain why. And then he's gonna have this quizzical look on his face, which I know is Sohan. He gets from his mother, which is why I love him so much. Um, and he's gonna have this quizzical look. It's like, okay, Daddy's about to, like, talk me out of this thing that I know is awesome. And here's what I'm gonna tell him. It's like, I'm gonna say, Sohan, once upon a time, a long time ago, when you were a simply tiny human, companies did silly things. They did impolite things. They did things that made people angry. But sometimes it didn't matter. People bought from them anyway. But that was then. Now, Nobody buys from those kinds of companies anymore, Sohan. 
Nobody buys from those kinds of companies, which is a very, very good thing. And you want to know what brought about this change? You want to know who's responsible? And he's going to look at me with his big eyes, and he's going to say, you, daddy? And I'm going to say, no, it wasn't me. It was daddy's friends. And daddy has thousands and thousands of friends. So my friends, this is my closing call to action. I still work in marketing. Closing call to action. <laughs> this is not the time for small tweaks. This is the time for transformation. Transformation. This is not the time to rejigger those campaigns. This is the time to reimagine how your business works, how you can make humans happier. This is the time to go all inbound. Thank you. Okay, everyone stand up. Stretch out like a big cat. Ah, ah, ah. Sit back down. <laughs> okay, so uh, Dharmesh talked today about the, 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 the radical nature in which humans are changing the way they shop for things, the way they buy things, and the way they use things. Really compelling, I thought. And then he talked about how companies, well, they need to make a, a radical shift, too. They need to transform the way they market, and the way they sell, and the way they service uh, customers today. He calls this the inbound experience. My job today is I want to talk about the technology platform that HubSpot's building to enable all of you to create an inbound experience for all of your prospects and leads and customers. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And in order to tell you uh, the story um, about the technology, I want to tell you a story about a, a typical Friday night in the life of, of myself and my dog, Romeo. And th that's Romeo. Say hello to Romeo. Um, every Friday night, uh, Romeo and I, we like to get out to Cape Cod and relax. We work hard all week, uh, and the two of us uh, want to relax in Cape Cod. And the story I want to tell you is the story about the technology we use on the way to Cape Cod, how that technology is changing to help create a much more inbound trip to Cape Cod. And hopefully, the dots will connect, and it will show you how HubSpot's technology is changing. So let's get started. So the first piece of technology uh, Romeo and I run across is the uh, thermostat. 
and it's Romeo's job to turn off the darn thermostat, and he, for every Friday night he forgets to turn off the air conditioner. It's a constant source of tension between the two of us, So Romeo always forgets to turn off that darn air conditioner. And so Romeo had a suggestion for me. And the suggestion was, why don't we get a nest? And I said, a nest? What kind of a dog wants to sleep in a nest? You've got a perfectly fine dog bed, and it's in HubSpot Orange to boot. And Romeo said, no, 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 not that kind of nest. A nest is a new type of thermostat. It's a thermostat that understands us and personalizes itself for us. It's this powerful new thermostat. And so now we head down to Cape Cod, the tension is gone between us, the thermostat automatically turns the AC off on Friday night and automatically turns it back on on Monday morning. That's the first piece of technology. The second piece of technology we, are, we run into is the radio. Romes and I, we like to listen to the radio on the way to Cape Cod, and we listen to uh, 92.9 here in Boston on the way to the Cape. We've done this for years. And 92.9 is a good station. They play a little Dave Matthews and Coldplay, stuff like that. There's one, one, one problem with 92.9. Anyone here from Boston, what's the problem with 92.9? This is probably true. Yes, that wasn't what I was thinking. Uh, <laughs> it, <laughs> it turns out they don't play, Romeo and I share a favorite band. And, and Romeo toured with this band for many years. In 92.9, they never play The Grateful Dead. And we're huge deadheads, Romeo and me. And, and, and this is Romeo's t-shirt from, from the tour, Inbound 13, Jamming Out to the Dead. And you could listen to 92.9 for 100 years and, and never hear One Republic or The Grateful Dead. And it's, it's, it's really irritating. Uh, and so uh, Romeo made another suggestion. He said, uh, we ought to get Spotify. And I said, what's the Spotify, Romeo? What, what's the Spotify? It sounds, like, it sounds like one of those stupid dog toys. You're always spending all our money on these stupid dog toys. You never use them. And he said, no, 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 no. Spotify. Spotify is a new type of radio, and it understands us, and it understands our preference. It knows we like the Grateful Dead. So now we're on the way to Cape Cod. We're happy as clams because we're jamming out to the Grateful Dead and the whole way. We've got a series of stations of the Grateful Dead. Here's a picture of Romeo and I heading down the Cape. <laughs> uh, we're looking very happy for a couple of reasons. One is the thermostat is in good shape, the air conditioner's off. The other reason is we're jamming out to our favorite song uh, from the Grateful Dead. Uh, and it's really a, a fun trip to Cape Cod when we're jamming out to our, our favorite song uh, on the way there. And this is how it works. I get the air guitar. I play the air guitar, he's got the air drums. He's awesome on the drums, you ought to see him. So we get to the Cape, and the two of us, we're beat. And we get to the Cape, and we, what we really want to do is we want to put our paws up and relax. Really just put our paws up and relax. And so the two of us uh, turn on the TV, and we turn on the TV, uh, we click around the stations. It's Friday night, sorry, I'm out of breath. Hold on. always wanted to dance in front of 5,300 people. How cool is that? <laughs> and we always watch, it, it, every Friday night, it, we always end up watching Game of Thrones. Who out there is a Game of Thrones fan? Let's hear it for Game of Thrones. Yeah? I don't get it. I don't get the show. It's confusing. I must be too old. I don't get you people. Romeo likes it too. I don't get it. So Romeo made a suggestion. And this time I'm wise to this dog. And I just say, all right, what is it? He said, uh, we ought, to get a, uh, we ought to get a Netflix. And I'm like, all right, what's a Netflix? And so he told me about Netflix. It's a new type of TV. It's a new type, uh, new type of television, new way of watch watching television. And it understands us, and it really personalizes itself for us. It's really cool. And so now we get down to Cape Cod. We've got our own custom stations just for us. In our favorite station, this is the real screenshot from our favorite station. A lot of people might think it's an oxymoron, but both of us, we love this station. 
It's suspenseful documentaries. We love suspenseful documentaries. <laughs> Our favorite ones, Westminster Kennel Club's fantastic show, Dog Whisperer, really great stuff. Uh, so that's the trip down to Cape Cod. If you're seeing a pattern here, give it up. You're seeing a pattern on the technology? Here, see the pattern? All right. Here's a pattern. Uh, you're not only good looking, you're smart. Uh, the pattern is, there's all these technologies on the left in the Venn column. They're kind of dumb. They don't understand us, they're not personalized. And then these, th these new technologies on the right. And they really understand our patterns quite well. They come to understand us. And they're, and they're transforming their industries in a, in, a, in a big way. And so, the way they do this, they all do it the exact same way. What they do is, is they take these dumb applications, they infuse them with context. They add context to them, and it brings them alive, and it makes that experience much better. And it's this idea of context that's infused into the applications that's giving Romeo and I a very inbound experience as we drive to Cape Cod. And it's this idea of context that's going to help all of you create the inbound experience for your prospects and leads and customers. Context creates this inbound experience. Okay? So Romeo and I got talking about it, and it wasn't just these three applications. It turns out everywhere we go in our personal lives, um, consumer apps are going through this massive transformation where there's applications on the left. It's rather dumb. They don't understand us. They lack context. And there's new companies and applications running over those industries on the right that are transforming them by infusing them with context. So my job today is to tell you about some new applications from HubSpot they are going to take stuff from the left column, move them to the right column. Hopefully, we're transforming some industries today. And hopefully, we're enabling you to create a lovely inbound experience for all your prospects and customers. How's that sound? Sweet. Still breathing heavily from that <laughs> dance moves. In case you're wondering, there's no more dancing. There might be some singing. Um, okay, first application we want to take a look at that's stuck in the then column is social media applications. And there's a lot of them on the market today, and they all look basically the same. They look like this, tons of competition. And the problem with them is, it's the same problem with all of them, they all lack this idea of context. And it's darn hard to create an inbound social experience for your prospects and leads and customers when your social media apps don't understand your business and can't give context to that experience. They can't tell the difference between a stranger visiting your site, qualify, sorry, a stranger in social media, a lead in social media, or a customer in social media. It's all hay, no needles. All hay, no needles. It's really hard to figure out what's going on. Really hard to create an inbound social experience. These social media apps, they just don't understand us. It's not personalized. They're like the radio, they're like the TV, they're like these old school apps. And so Dramesh and I, uh, we're really interested in social media. Very early adopters of social media tools. Um, we built some social media tools ourselves. And what we thought is it's time to reimagine the way these social media apps should work. It's, it's time to reimagine them from strat scratch. And it's time to reimagine social media apps to match the modern buying experience by infusing them with context and breathing new life into them. So we are very, very happy to announce a, a new product that we've been building for the last year. It's gonna transform the social media listening industry and we call it Social Inbox. Okay. So what I'd like to do with Social Inbox, if it's okay, I'd like to show you how I use it. And in, in, in that effort, what I hope to show you is that it's so easy to use that even a CEO can use it. It's really easy software to use, okay? Okay, so let's, let's dig in. This, this is HubSpot's new Social Inbox. I'm one of the most active users on the planet of this uh, application. I really love this app, Subspotters know. Um, in the middle here is a stream that I've created where I'm listening for anyone mentioning HubSpot on Twitter. And frankly, that's not particularly unique. Lots of tools can do that. But what's really awesome about the social inbox, where you pull the needles out from the hay, where you add the context, are these lines next to the people's pictures. And so what these lines tell me, the orange lines 
Those, those are leads in my database. The green lines next to their pictures, those are customers. All needles, no hay. Pulling the context out, adding context into social media, really powerful. Love this application. Let me show you how I create one of these new, powerful, context-rich social media streams that are gonna enable you to create an inbound experience. So I go, and on the right there, I click Create a Stream. It's very easy to use, and I have to answer three simple questions. First question is, who do you wanna to listen to in Twitter? Who is it do you wanna to listen to? And the nice part about this is we use our contacts application, but we create lists on top of the contacts application to do our email marketing. We're just gonna reuse those lists for social media. So I'm gonna grab a list of all of HubSpot's leads, pull that out, and then what it's gonna ask me is what do you want to listen for? And so I've got my list of leads here, and then I wanna pull out any time any one of my leads mentions inbound marketing or HubSpot. I don't want all the hay, I just want the needles. And then it's going to ask me, well, how would you like to be notified? Do you want an email notification? Do you want an email digest? Do you want to log into the app? Very, very powerful. I finish setting it up, I name it, and I'm good to go. Three questions and I've got an awesome new social media stream built in Social Inbox. How cool is that? Um, Uh, okay, so this is a stream in the middle, and as you can see, it's leads talking about HubSpot or inbound marketing, exactly the way I set it up. There's orange stripes next to all the pictures, so they're all leads, all needle and snow hay. And what I wanna do is I wanna drill in on that first tweet. It looks like this fellow's having a hard time getting his RSS uh, set up. I'm gonna go ahead and drill in on him, and this is his tweet, and it's gonna show me additional context. In addition to the fact he's a lead, what I can find out right from within this application is who his salesperson is, and it's Ali Powell. I love Ali Powell, longtime HubSpotter. I can find even more context about this person, and I can go and drill in and see what his contacts record looks like inside of HubSpot. So I go in and I look at him inside the contacts tool and look at his the timeline, and I find out this guy's awesome. He's a qualified lead, he's in a trial, he's got three days left in the trial, and he's having a problem. And so what I wanna do is I wanna go back to his tweet, and rather than my responding to him, because I don't have the context here, what I want to do is, is, is forward that tweet. I'm going to follow him, and then I'm going to forward the tweet to Allie and let Allie follow up with him, because she's got the context around this. So it's breathing context through the entire organization. Very, very powerful new social media tool. I absolutely love it. That's the way it works for business. Now, what I want to show you is I use this for HubSpot. Um, our marketing people use it all, everybody at HubSpot's using it essentially. I wanna show you how I use it in my personal life. Because this is an application that I use all the time. I've got three tabs open at all times in my browser. I've got my email, my calendar, and now I have my social inbox. And uh, I listen to all, I have all kinds of streams that I've set up. These are a couple I've set up, like the Grateful Dead, as you might imagine, the Red Sox and news and stuff like that, and this is my actual stream. And, and it used to be when Romeo and I would start the day, We'd, we'd, get the new, we'd read the newspaper together, we'd share, we'd talk about the stories in the newspaper, and that was all quite nice, we'd have coffee together. But nowadays, when we start the day, we both like to start the day with the social inbox. <laughs> I usually like to drink my coffee out of a bowl, but Romeo said, nah, it's a big picture, big stage, you better drink it out of a mug today. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's my favorite picture in the whole deck, I just love that. Uh, <clears throat> Now, I'm using it at home, I'm using it at work, well, what about in between? The sweet thing about the social inbox is it's now, as of today, available on your iPhone. So excited about it, it is a mobilicious app. I just <laughs> love uh, this application on my iPhone. Okay, if you would like to get the app, and I hope you would, Go on your iPhone, go to your iPhone and just update your HubSpot app and, this, and all your streams will come right into it. And we put a couple of inbound 13 Easter eggs in there, so I recommend everyone do it. It's super cool. Now, how do we do this magic? How do we create this context? We do it in a very simple way. Because we have the contacts application, we build the list application on top of it, we essentially just build our social inbox app on top of the contacts app, and it's the contacts app that breathes this context into it, and it makes it unique and enables all of you to create this inbound experience. So it's a very simple uh, magic formula for us in how we do this stuff. 
If you're interested in this, is anyone interested? Uh, there's a couple of things you can do. Sign up for a test drive. And so we're gonna, we're gonna set up after my talk today, test drives this app and you can have one of the HubSpotters show you how to, uh, to set up a stream for yourself. And then what I'd like you to do is set up a stream for yourself, a series of stream. It's awesome for marketers. Brittany in our marketing department has 30 streams set up for all kinds of interesting stuff. But then what I want you to do is set up streams for your salespeople. And he, it, it's, it's awesome for marketers. It is unbelievable for salespeople. And here's what I would do if I were you. I would go into the app and I would grab for that sales rep, here's your list of leads, and then I want to say, for your list of leads, our brand, our competitor's brand, our keywords, and then I want to configure it and say, as a sales rep, anytime any of your leads mentions any of those things, you automatically get an email. So the sales rep doesn't even need to configure it, you set it up for each of the sales reps. The sales reps are going to kiss your took us. They are going to love you. Service people too. So this is our first app that we're building. Great for marketers, but really built for the entire end-to-end -end inbound experience. Very, very powerful new app, the social inbox. Okay. How am I doing so far? <laughs> My heart rate slowed down. The next app we want to look at that we think's stuck in the then column is Ye Old Website. The website's been around for a long time and people use content management systems to power their websites. The interesting thing about the content management system industry is it is wildly competitive. There are hundreds of people competing in this industry. The problem is they all have the exact same problem. They completely lack this idea of context. They don't understand us. They can't personalize themselves to us. They can't really do that new type of now column stuff. And, and, and to illustrate that, I want to give you an example. And so when I visit a website, and it's the first time I visit it, I get experience A when I visit that website for the first time. And then I come away, and I go back, and I visit the website six or seven more times. I'm a qualified lead, I'm talking to one of the sales reps, I'm on the forecast, and I go back and visit the website. It's the tenth time I visit the website. This time when I visit the website, this time I get experience A. That's right, the exact same experience. Okay? Then, engage with the sales rep, I buy, I become a happy customer, I've got a net promoter score of 10, I'm telling all my friends that I go back and visit the website. This time it's the hundredth time I visit the website. This time when I visit the website, I get experience A. That's right, exact same experience. Uh, this type of website, this type of experience, 99.99% of websites are like this. It reminds me of Romeo's favorite movie, and we've seen this movie a hundred times. Groundhog Day, Romeo just loves that movie. Websites are a lot like Groundhog Day. It's the same thing over and over and over again. Websites cannot tell the difference between a complete stranger, a qualified lead on the forecast, or a loyal customer. Big, big context problem with websites. They can't tell who you are, what you've done. The other thing they can't tell is where you came from. 99% of websites can't tell if you came from an iPhone, a tablet or a computer, and they don't adjust themselves well. Darmesh already showed some compelling data about this. This is the data we pull from HubSpot. 13% of the visitors to the, all of HubSpot's customers, you get about a billion page views a month across HubSpot. 13% of them come through mobile. Uh, that's basically 13% of your funnel. You are just flushing down the drain. Uh, and so they're not, uh, they're not well set up for where people are coming from. Okay, so we have our own CMS, people know about that in the, in the Venn column, and, and we've been thinking about this problem for an awfully long time, seven years since we started HubSpot. And we sort of reimagined what a website should be. A website, it needs to be optimized for the modern buying experience. It needs to be optimized for the buyer where, based on where they are in the buying cycle. It needs to be optimized based on what device they're coming from. And so we put a team together two years ago, a long time ago, pretty big team, to reimagine what that modern website would look like. How do we create an inbound experience across the entire buying cycle? And today's a very big day for that team. Very big day for me and HubSpotters. Very big day for our customers. We have a brand new, I think, revolutionary now column type of website system that's going to transform the way 
We sell our products, and we call it the content optimization system. Okay, you're probably asking yourselves, why the heck did you call it a content optimization? Why didn't you just call it a CMS? Well, we think it's different than a CMS. You hire a CMS for a certain job, and what you hire a CMS for is to take your brochure, beautiful brochure, and turn it into an online presence. And, and it worked very well. It's been 10, 12 years of the CMS industry. You hire the COS for a completely different reason. You hire a COS to turn your website into your best sales rep. Very different use case for a COS than for a CMS. So we think it's the beginning of a major transformation in the website industry. And what we did is we created a suspenseful documentary for you about the COS. Why don't we have a look? Being inbound is about understanding that at the other end of, of your marketing, every tweet, every email, uh, every purchase, um, every website visit is, is a human. So a typical CMS is that static website. And even when they're beautiful, um, they speak to the people exactly the same way. So different people coming to that same website uh, are gonna have the exact same experience. We always were able to make these websites that looked great, functional. It's the first thing that people see, but we want it to be more than that. But it really needs to tailor content to a specific person. So I think everybody understands at this point that, that content is, is super important to the inbound story. Uh, the reality is that though even the best content without context um, may not be that successful. Uh, context is all about understanding how you've already engaged with them, the relationship you've already had, what devices they're using to view your content, and really using that to have a much more intelligent conversation. At Magellan Jets, we provide high-end private jet service to C-level executives, business people. Today, Magellan Jets is where it's at because we've excelled on the personalized service and attention to detail that we provide our clients on the aircraft and at the terminal. It's absolutely vital for us to take that personalized experience that we give customers in the air and bring that to every interaction. We knew that there's, there's a whole series of things that we can do once we start thinking about the person at the other end of the marketing. When a potential customer comes to the site for the first time, we want them to have a different experience than the customer that has been doing business with us for five years. People aren't static, and their relationship with you changes. One day they're a visitor that you've never engaged with, the next day they're a customer. We wanted to build a, a, a set of tools that would allow marketers to be able to take advantage of this, this idea of engaging with context. That really gave birth to this idea of the content optimization system, which we're calling the COS. Well, what we've been able to do with the new COS is not only make that great looking presence of your brand online, but also serve up relevant content for what that person wants to engage with. Providing them with great content is one thing. Uh, but what we want to do is really take that to the next level. If your customers are online and leveraging mobile, you need to build your site with responsive design. And HubSpot COS already has that functionality built in. The COS actually makes customers' lives better. The result is that you're going to have a much more engaged relationship with, with these people that are visiting you and that you're engaging with your marketing. Our industry exists because of the need for that interaction with your clients on a personal level. For us to be able to cater to that need puts us in a really great place. The COS is all about helping marketers to actually accomplish that vision of thinking about people at the other end of your marketing as humans. insight into the way uh, we at HubSpot think about the marketing technology. Marketing technology is fascinating. We're in a very interesting industry. It's changing very fast. And I want to give you peer, let you peer into our minds of the way we think about it. When I think of the CMS to, to COS transition, it, it, in my mind, it's the exact same thing as the transition we're in the middle of from email marketing, where you created a long list of every customer and lead and cat and dog and scarecrow you've ever met in your entire life, and you send them the same email. And you got a conversion rate of that of, let's say, X. And we're moving, we're probably in the third inning of this move to the marketing automation industry, sort of email 
and it works. You're able to create segments and personalize these emails and create workflow, and it works much better. In fact, when we look at our data inside of HubSpot, if people move from email marketing to marketing, it's a 2x click-through rate, so it's a much improved experience. The CMS, the CMS is the exact same thing. The CMS, everyone gets the same experience no matter where they are in the funnel, no matter what they've done, no matter what device they've used. Uh, there's no context to it. The move to COS, it's the exact same thing, and I think the industry will develop in a very similar way. But here, we're in the top of the, we're, in, we're singing the national anthem of the transition from CMS to COS, and I think this is a natural move. HubSpot's the first one to build this new type of system, but I think lots and lots of people will do it. So that's how we think about the industry. I think it's gonna develop very quickly. When we look at our own data, of using static CMS pages and these newer dynamic COS pages, the conversion rate's even better um, than the, the conversion rate on email. It's X percent here, 2.7X percent here. So it's, it's really much, much better. Um, why don't we have a look at the COS? So this is the COS. Now, a lot of you might think, well, that looks cool, but it sounds hard. You know, it sounds like it's gonna be hard to use, complicated. It's not. If you're using HubSpot and you're using our email marketing, you already know how to use the COS. It's that easy, it's the same UI. You've got the same UI for the homepage, blog, email, landing page, Microsoft, no matter what you're building, same exact UI. You already know how to use it. That's the beautiful thing about it. And so this is the first revision of this homepage I'm building. It's a site I'm building for myself to teach CEOs how to use Twitter. And then I wanna create a second version of this homepage. It's just like you use with HubSpot on your email. Uh, the first thing you do is say, who, who do I want to create this homepage for? Very similar to Social Inbox, what I say is I want to create another version of the homepage just for my leads, and then I want to add personalization tags to it, just like I do in email. So I want to mention when a lead, I want to mention the lead's name, their company, and their sales rep's name. I want to make it very personalized and contextualized to that uh, person. And then I'm gonna create a third version of that page just for customers can ask me who. I want to create this page so when customers visit, it'll be smart and it'll change itself for customers. I want to personalize it. I want to make it really nice. So now, the first time I visit your website, I'm going to get experience A. But the second time, I'm going to get experience B. And the third time, I'm going to get experience C. How cool is that? <laughs> Okay, now there's a, a jillion cool features in the COS. Uh, our roots are in search engine optimization, social, all that stuff's in there. I don't have time to talk about all of them. One of them that's hot, hot, hot is the mobile features. Really cool, so I wanna show you the mobile. Here's a blog article that I'm writing to promote this new website I've built. And if, if, if you know how to create an email or a web page inside of HubSpot, you already know how to create a blog article. So this is a blog article I'm creating. On the left side, I'm editing the blog article. On the right side, I get a preview. And this is the preview. This is what my article is going to look like on a desktop computer. And it's one click of a button, and then you can see what it looks like on a mobile device. How cool is that? One button. <laughs> <laughs> Want to see it again? Let's see it again. That was really cool. I'm getting back. That's the desktop view. That, That's the mobile view, is that easy? <laughs> okay, we built, the fancy term for it is responsive design. You don't have to be fancy to know how to use it. You build it once in HubSpot and it looks perfect in all tablets, all mobile devices. It'll look perfect when Google Glasses figures their act out. It look perfect everywhere. Uh, it is awesome. Um, now, a lot of you might be thinking, well, that looks cool, COS is cool. What about your CMS? You've got a CMS, and that CMS isn't going anywhere. The rub on HubSpot CMS, the number one complaint we get, isn't necessarily from marketers. Marketers find it very easy to use, but the loud complaints we've gotten historically on the CMS are from designers, our own designers, designers from our partners, designers and our customers, and they didn't have the flexibility they needed to build beautiful, gorgeous sites and let their creativity go wild. I think we've nailed it with the COS. Easy to use for marketers. I think marketers are gonna love it. I think designers are gonna wanna marry it. It is just <laughs> awesome. 
Uh, let me show you a couple sites that a couple designers have built over the last couple weeks that are beautiful. Ironically, this first site is a guy that's building a uh, documentary about surfers, a suspenseful documentary about surfers. Beautiful, isn't it? Look at that. We could never do that before with our CMS. That's Magellan's site. Gorgeous. That's the March of Dimes site. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Okay. So that's the COS. The way we do this crazy stuff and infuse context is the same way we do it with the social inbox. We've got the contacts database and we build your website system on top of it and it's the context system that infuses context into it that allows you to personalize it. It's gonna allow you to create an inbound experience that changes for a first time visitor, for a lead, for a customer and dramatically increase the happiness of your potential customers. Um, so if you're interested in this, who's interested? Uh, sign up for a test drive. We're going to do the same thing. Go get your, your, your hands dirty. Um, I want to give some advice to our customers who are on the existing CMS. And, and we, we did a survey of marketers in the crowd, or not in the crowd, all our marketer customers, and we asked them, <laughs> we asked them a, a question. We said, how often does your CEO ask you to redesign your website? It turns out it's once a week. <laughs> So week after week after week, your darn CEO is asking you to redesign your website. One of these days, you're going to do it. And when you do it, do it on the COS. That's a perfect time to do it. And when you do it, don't think about the COS as like some landing page system microsite. It's a full-blown system for your full-blown site. Think of it like that for your full, full, full system. I think you're going to love it. It's built for marketers, first and foremost, but it's going to enable marketers to really delight the salespeople and service people in their companies. That's the COS, brand new application from HubSpot, really excited about it. Okay. Darmesh's talk was great. I like the service part and I, I can't, it's very similar to our model, uh, the service part. And the way I think about HubSpot and I think about all of you, our customers and our partners, is in HubSpot, our model is set up so we are completely dedicated to and completely dependent on your delation. It's your delation that gets us up early in the morning. It's your delation that keeps us up late at night. It's your delation uh, that drives all our product development. So I want to talk about a couple things we're working on uh, to try to delight you even further. First thing we're doing to try to delight our customers is we are leaning in on the R&D spend. So we increased our R&D spend year over year 58%, so major, major increase in R&D. Our whole model is predicated on the fact that you all are happy and excited customers and telling all your friends. And so we're investing heavily in R&D. We did two acquisitions this year. We put in 300 major enhancements across the platform, across all of our different applications, some awesome enhancements like lead scoring and email A-B testing, anyone like that stuff? Okay. Uh, we, we built an uh, uh, awesome iPhone app and Android app this year, anyone love that stuff? Okay. We built a sister product to Social Inbox called Social Publisher, if you're not using that, it rocks, awesome new application. Um, and then we just released a couple weeks ago a custom reporting app that I think you'll really like, it sort of sits between Google Analytics and Salesforce, I, I think you're really gonna like it. My personal opinion is we've had a big year on the product side. We've really uh, dramatically improved our product. The quality is better, the UI is better, nice new apps. If you agree with me, would you mind giving it up for my software development team? It's not just about the software there, we want to delight your entire experience. So this year we, we built a HubSpot Academy. Give it up if, if, if you've been delighted by a HubSpot Academy class. Uh, 100,000 people served. We also doubled our investment in support. Uh, back in February, support wait time was 15 minutes, unacceptable. I haven't seen it over a minute in three months. Give it up for our support folks. Okay. 
So it's been a big year. A couple whopper new applications, a bunch of enhancements. Um, but there's one more thing we want to talk about today that is, I think you're going to like. Uh, there's one area of software that we think there's a big gap in, and that's sales technology. There's a big, big gap in the way uh, sales technology works. And when I think of sales technology, I can't help but think of this guy. <laughs> nice hair. Uh, that's me in the 90s when I was a salesperson. And Darmesh hit the nail on the head. There's a dramatic shift. In, in, in the sales process today, that sales rep used to control the sales press, control the buyer, control the entire situation, have all the power, it's wildly shifted. And now the prospect has all the leverage, all the power in the relationship. And that's a problem. And, and, and the problem for the sales rep is they lack context in that relationship. They don't have the context to keep up with the prospect. The prospect oftentimes knows more than they do. And so there's a lot of sales technology out there, and they're very good technologies. Most of them were built in the 1990s when the shift hasn't happened. And so I think there's a giant gaping hole for HubSpot that's been created to enable sales reps to have 10 times more context in the conversation with their potential customers than they do today. And so we've been thinking about, I've been thinking about this since business school before we started HubSpot. And, uh, and Darmesh and I, we put a team together uh, just after inbound last year. We put one of our best technical leaders in charge of the team. It's a startup inside of start, a startup. So we, we just put, we kind of put them aside and let them do their thing. We bought two companies for them with great new technology and new people. And they've been chartered with in, infusing context into that sales call, with making that sales call an inbound experience. And they have been cranking for a full year on this day, on this thing. And, and today's a huge day for them, a huge day for all of us. I think a huge day for salespeople everywhere as we're first time we're showing it to the world, first time announcing it, a brand new product from HubSpot for salespeople called Signals. Anyone want to see it? I'm getting tired, I was gonna go. Uh, okay, first thing that's so cool about Signals is it's an application that lives inside of all the applications the other sales reps use. It's not this application that pulls them out of their daily job, it lives inside of other applications. We were inspired here by our friends at Dropbox. What Dropbox does is it works inside your file system very powerfully, so that's the way it works. So what I wanna do is go through a little role play with all of you, I'll be the sales rep, and we'll go through a little role play. So this is Signals, and this is where I spend some time in my browser on ESPN.com. And uh, I'm sitting back, and I'm, I'm looking up the box score from last night's Red Sox win against the Giants. Um, and I get a signal, and that's why we call it Signals, that Chad Miller, I got, an email, I got a lead from Chad Miller from my CRM system. And that's how it pops up. Pops up it, HubSpot works inside of your, uh, sorry, Signals works inside of your browser and it pops up inside the browser. There's a big benefit to this. And the big benefit is when you get a lead through a CRM system and it's delivered through email, the darn interwebs slow those emails down and it can take 20, 30 minutes to deliver those emails and that 20, 30 minutes is worth a lot of time and money for that sales rep. And so what happens when you use the browser to do this is it's immediate. The second that lead comes in, you don't waste a second. So I get that lead uh, from my CRM system, very happy with it, and the first thing I do if I'm a good sales rep is I go to LinkedIn. So I head over to LinkedIn, and I look this guy up, and he looks like a real good fit. He's a C-level guy, he's the real deal, and there's a button that pops up that's very interesting. Anyone ever seen this button on LinkedIn before? Of course not, you're not using signals yet. <laughs> this is a button I've always wanted. It's a watch button, I wanna keep my eye on this guy, so if anything changes about him, I'll be the first one to know. It'll keep me up to date on his LinkedIn. So I keep an eye on him, and then I go back to my email. Very quickly, I wanna send this guy an email. So I craft the email and I send it. And here's where the trouble starts for salespeople. By the way, it runs inside of LinkedIn. How cool was that? <laughs> I missed that. Uh, send the email uh, out to this guy, and uh, I send the email out. And it goes out to them, and the problem for sales reps is they send the email out, 
and they don't know if it's been opened and they don't know if the link's been clicked on and it's an existential friggin' crisis for the sales rep. They sent the email, they're like, should I call them now? Maybe I'll wait. Maybe I'll call them now. Wait. You just don't know. What's, what's so cool about marketers is they know this stuff. You market, marketers, you're sneaky, sneaky. Marketers for a long time have had the ability to send an email and you know exactly who opened it and exactly what they clicked on and have all this cool analytics and it's super valuable to marketers. It's 50 times more valuable to a sales rep. And so what we did is very clever. We built signals into Gmail and Outlook so it works inside of there. So when that prospect opens the email, the sales rep's immediately notified. Existential crisis ended. Okay, so I'm the sales rep, open the email, but I'm gonna sit back. Cool cat. Sit back, I'm gonna wait till he clicks on my link. Wait, let me sit back. I'm gonna go into my spreadsheet and work on my forecast for my boss. And I'm working on a spreadsheet, working on a spreadsheet, and then I get another signal. And this time, the signal is from LinkedIn. So I kept an eye on him in LinkedIn and it's infused into LinkedIn, and it tells me that he's uploaded a nice article in LinkedIn. So I'm gonna go over to LinkedIn, I'm gonna read the article, find out what's going on inside his head, really get inside of this guy's head in an interesting way, and then I'm gonna go back to work. And naturally, when I go back to work, I'm on NewYorkTimes.com, getting some stuff done. <laughs> uh, and I'm on NewYorkTimes.com, and I'm playing it cool with this guy, Chad Miller. Playing it cool. I open my email, I'm not gonna call him until he clicks on the pricing link that I sent him. I want him to read that pricing page. I, I want my first conversation with him to happen after he knows my pricing. Sitting back, sitting back, starting to worry, starting to worry. Should I call him? Should I call him? Should I call him? I'm not sure. And then it comes through. The signal comes through, he clicked on the link, he's on the pricing page right now, it's so exciting. I know a lot about this guy at this point, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick up the phone and I'm gonna call him, and this is going to be a wholly different conversation than I've ever had with a prospect. I know so much about them, 10 times more context than I've ever had. This is the way Signals works. I think you're gonna love it. It's a brand new product from HubSpot. If you're interested in it, it's so easy. You don't need a, a hands-on session. Just go, we create a new URL for it. Go to getsignals.com to, to, to start using it. Okay. This is another app. It's great, for, marketers are gonna really love this app. Um, salespeople are gonna kiss your toes uh, when you give it to them. So get, get all your salespeople, all the service people set up with it. They are going to absolutely love it. It brings your HubSpot implementation to life. You're working hard to create all those leads, bring those leads to life and increase the conversion rates for them by getting everybody on your customer team on Signals. Now, the pricing for Signals is new. The basic version is this hot, hot, hot feature for email that monitors when people open your email, and that costs nothing. It's free. <laughs> uh, permanently free. It's a freemium model, and then the version that connects with Salesforce and HubSpot that infuses that context from those systems, that's $10 a month. So it's built, really built to spread. Uh, so that's Signals. The way we build Signals is very similar to the rest of our products. We've had a big day today, and I'll wind down a little bit. What we've wanted to do, what we started the day talking about, is on our consumer life, all the applications we use, they've been reimagined and transformed by the infusion of context into them, and they become much more valuable, much better experience. And what we bemoaned was the B2B applications haven't done that. So today what we did is we announced three brand new applica applications to transform the way you interact in social, transform the way you interact on the web, transform the way you have sales calls. It's been a very, very big day for HubSpot. And the way we did it, it's very, very simple. We're the only ones crazy enough out there to build all of this software from the ground up on the same platform. And it's the connection between all of this stuff that's so, so powerful. We built everything on top of the contacts database. It's this contacts database that breathes and fuses context into our social, into our website, into our sales, into our email. We think it's gonna be a really powerful platform for all of you to grow your business. All right. 
So I want to wind down here. There's 600 HubSpotters. If you could all join me in thanking uh, the 1,300 HubSpot partners out there. We love our partners. Thank you very much. And then there's one other big number we're announcing today. Uh, we've, been, we've been cranking away on this. And, and this month, we're going to hit our uh, uh, 10,000th customer here at HubSpot. So thank you to all 10,000 HubSpot customers. And thank you all for coming.